All right. Um, moving along with part, a uh, third uh, part of the series on St. Maximus the Confessor, still on the introduction um, to uh, On the Cosmic Mysteries of Jesus Christ. We're going to be going through the section entitled Jesus Christ in the Transformation of Human Passibility. The key to Maximus' teaching on the fall, human passibility, and the universality of sin is his conviction that the incarnate Christ assumes the whole legacy of human fallenness while not wavering from the divine initiative toward the deification of creation. In Ambiguum 42, for example, he makes much of the fact that in the singular action of his incarnation, the Savior fused the creaturely origin, genesis, of humanity with um, a birth subject to the pro, uh, procreative conditions of fallen humanity yet without sin. Only by perfectly merging these two things does he reveal himself truly as the new Adam. Rather than directly addressing the age-old question as to whether the incarnation would have, been, would have taken place had Adam not fallen, Maximus begins, um, as was noted earlier, with the mystery of the incarnation itself as the, as the lens through which to interpret the protology and the textology and the teleology of the universe. A number of extraordinary passages in Maximus's corpus boldly display his Christocentrism and his debt to Pauline theology of, of the mystery of Christ. Ambiguum 7 is undoubtedly central, but it is paralleled and amplified by Ad Thalassium 60, an uncontested locus classicus in the confessor's writing. The scriptural text in question here concerns God's foreknowledge of Christ as the, quote, pure and spotless lamb, end quote, the figure of whom appears prominently in Byzantine iconography. Maximus eloquently eulogizes Jesus Christ, the perfect hypostatic union of divine and human natures, as already constituting in himself the fullness of the Christian mystery. The comprehensive outworking of the divine plan for the redemption and deification of the world which God predetermined before the ages. Equally importantly, however, Maximus locates the incarnation within a Trinitarian matrix. The three persons foreknew the incarnation and shared mutually in its realization. The Father approving it, the Son properly carrying it out, the Spirit cooperating in it. This, for Maximus, is the gracious economy which encloses the whole of human history and makes possible both our rational knowledge of God and, more sublimely, our experience, experiential participation in the mystery of deification. In, if, if in Ad Thalassium 60, Maximus contemplates the mystery of Christ as divinely foreknown and predetermined before all ages, in Ad Thalassium 22, he enhances the properly eschatological dimension of the mystery. Christ is indeed the mystery hidden before the ages, but he is also the mystery at the end of the ages. Maximus waxes eloquent on the different possible senses of the ages in the, in the apostles' usage, but clearly in his interpretation of Paul, more is at stake than a mere sequence of ages of time. Christ comprehends both the ages of divine incarnation, the mystery of God's embodiment, and the ages of creaturely deification. The former have been cons consummated in the coming of Jesus, but so too the latter have already commenced through their remains that definitive end, telos, when natural creatures receiving in full grace of the incarnation will undergo an utter transformation rendered thoroughly passive to divine grace the ultimate passion of deification. Not surprisingly, given the shared concern of Maximus and Thalassus and Thalassius to situate the ascetic life within the larger mystery of deification, a number of questions in Thalassium addressed the issue of how precisely the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ inaugurated a transformation at the level of human passibility, a transformation that turned the very stigma of our fallen nature into a resource for ultimate personal communion with God. Generally speaking, within these texts, Maximus, Maximus intends to show how Christ took on himself natural human passibility, even the liability to deviant passions, but not the post, post lapsarian peaceabil, uh, peaceability, which for Adam's posterity has stymied the good use of the passable faculties. In so doing, Christ not only resolves the legacy of the fall, but pioneers a whole new modality, tropos for human passion, consistent with the soul's natural and perpetually graced desire for God. 
in Atlassian 21, for example, the text of Colossians 2.15 has puzzled Thalassius. The Greek is quite graphic in describing Christ as putting off or literally divesting himself of the wicked powers and principalities in his incarnation. Such must imply that he put them on in the first place, which seems entirely inconsistent with the presuppositions about Christ's immaculate conception and birth. Maximus exploits this ex exege exegetical aporion and so revisits an ancient Christological dilemma. Here, as in Ambiguum 42, he argues that Christ entered the world consistent with Adam's creaturely origin and created dignity. But what is more, for our sake, he subjected himself to the post-lapsarian pro procreative process of human birth in order that he might take on the liability to deviant passions, yet without sin. We know of, his, of this liability because Christ was inevitably tempted from the desert to the passion and used this testing precisely in order to dupe the op opportunistic powers and principalities, enslaving our passions, and so heal our human passibility from within. Maximus takes the same tack in Athelasium 42, where he carefully elucidates Paul's bold assertion that Christ became sin on our behalf. Demonstrating his exegetical sophistication, Maximus identifies the equivocation of the term sin in scripture and concludes that Christ became not the causal culpable sin committed by Adam and all his posterity who imitate him, but the consequential sin that I caused, namely the passibility, corruptibility, and mortality that have been introduced into human nature. Here, as in Athelasium 21, the confessor explores the depth of the, uh, the depth in the the interior mystery of Christ as the new Adam, the bearer and pioneer of eschatological humanity. At this juncture, long before the monoth monothelite controversy, Maximus was far more concerned with the dilemma, born of the controversy over originism of how Christ resolves the mutability of human volition and concomitantly, concomitantly the vulnerability or devi deviance of the human passions. Without hesitation, then, he ascribes Christ as an immutable power of free choice, as the means by which the Savior reoriented not only human free choice, but more existentially fragile gnomic will. Interestingly, in his commentary on the Lord's Prayer, written probably just a few years ago, um, the Ad Thalassium, he had openly ascribed to Christ himself the possession of the gnomic will, perfectly fixed on the good Though in Athelasium 21 and 42, he already appears to shy away from such an at attribution. Later on, correcting himself even more precisely in the heat of the monothelite crisis, he would deny both proheretic and gnomic will in Christ in affirming the pure integrity of Christ's natural human will. The change may already be hinted at in Athelasium 61, when Maximus, carefully choosing his terms, states that while humanity had fallen into sin through gnomic will, Christ exhibited the equity of his justice and the magnitude of his con condensation when he willingly submitted to the con condemnation imposed on our passibility and turned that very passibility into an instrument for eradicating sin and the death which is the consequence, which is its consequence. Or, in other words, for eradicating pleasure and, and the pain which is its consequence. Christ's human freedom and possible gnomic will have had have been continuing debating point in contemporary interpretations of Maximus Christology, and for good reason. For how can the individuated gnomic wills of the masses of fallen human beings be redeemed if Christ himself has not assumed gnomi? Maximus never seems to have resolved this issue directly. Once he had a categorically, categorically denied, gno denied gnomic will in Christ for fear of attributing vacillation to the Savior, we can only assume that he believed that the stabilization of our gnomic wills went hand in hand with the reorientation of the whole passable self accomplished through the perfect will of Christ operative in the hypostatic union. Opusculum 6, composed during the transition into Christological controversy that dominated the confessor's later career and giving us a glimpse of Maximus sometimes tenacious theological logic, reveals the maturing of his reflection on the set of questions. Athelasium 21 had broached the tempting or testing of Christ in the full sweep of his earthly ministry. Here in Obsculum 6, a text that Francis Marie Lethel credits as the true breakthrough in Maximus' criticism of monothelite Christology, 
The scene shifts squarely to the intense drama of Gethsemane when Jesus of Nazareth, in the particularity of a single historical moment, hands his human will over to the will of the Father, thereby demonstrating the perfect concrete concert of divine and human wills, free of all oppression or resistance, which makes possible the complete transformation of human passibility and mutability in the later Obscula 7 and 3, Maximus would expand at greater length on his magnificent interplay of wills in, in Gethsemane as a dramatic epitome of the incarnational economy as a whole. So that will uh, end this part of the introduction. Um, there's a few pages left that I might get into or I might just start at some of the ambiguum mentioned here in the introduction uh, the next go around. So thanks for listening.